to pray. Father, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 16, 21. From that, te- that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned (coughs) and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, now... The disciples, at this point, they've just come to the understanding that who he is. They've just come to the understanding that they understand he's God and he's the Messiah. And, and it was at that point, this is the point that's it's so in, it's in, in verse 21, it says, from that time forth, that was the time, began Jesus, no, let me kind of reset, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and be killed and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, raped again. So he starts to show them from this point the must of his mission. This is the imperative of his mission. He must go to Jerusalem. He must be ki- suffer many things. He must be killed. And, 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 and to, 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 so, in other words, for a man to save another man, from death, this has happened, and this is, uh, it's, it's not usual, but, but for God to become a man and to die for a man, this is what he wanted his disciples to understand, that he was God dying for man, just, and, and that's why it's, it's tied this in, verse 21, with the other part where it says in, in verse 16, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, from that time forward, he begins to show them this, just like the hymn puts it so well, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? It's mystery mystery all. The immortal dies. Who can explain this strange design? In vain, the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. It's mercy all. Let earth adore. Let angel, angel minds inquire no more. He left his father's throne above. So free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. So he's already, up until this point in, in the history, he's already made some, 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 some statements that, that, may, that may have caused the disciples to wonder. It's, it's like hints that he's going to be killed. You know, he said things like in John 2.19, John 2.19, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. So it caused you to hear that. You wonder, what is he talking about? And then in John 12, 32, 12, 12, 32, he's already said, if I be lifted up from the, from the earth, I'll draw all men to himself, I'll draw all men unto me. Again, the cause of wonder, if I be lifted up, what's this mean? But these statements didn't, didn't explain clearly this exactly what he's now telling them in verse 21. Oh, he, he, now he's explained to them, going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer many things, I'm going to be killed. He is God in the form of men. So this is a beginning to unfold the, the mystery. The mystery of Romans 16.25. Romans 16.25 says, The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. This is a secret that's been kept, and now he's revealing it. And we're, telling who he's, we're told who he revealed this to. It says in verse 25 he, he, that... From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples in the revelation he's going to suffer, be killed, be raised again. Not to the multitude. Not to the people. They they were 
This was told just to the disciples and how fortunate they were to, to find this out as has already been explained in Matthew 13.10. Matthew 13.10, when the disciples came and said to him, Matthew 13.10, Why speakest thou unto them, the multitude, in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not given. So this, is the, this was the, the, the to whom this revelation was given. And then he reveals the where, the place, in verse 21, he must go unto Jerusalem. Now, he spent, a lot, he spent all, most of his time in Galilee, up in the north. He's up there in the, in the north. He's ministering to the, really, the, the Galilee could be kind of considered the outcasts of Jerusalem. You know, when you get thrown out of Jerusalem, where do you go? You go to Galilee. You know, you, you go up there, and, and, and the people, and it's like, it's like the Tijuana of Mexico. I shouldn't say that, but anyway, it's like, uh, I remember one time I went down to uh, Mexico City with our group, and we were, uh, we went to the Ministry of Health there. We were trying to get permission to, um, to inject, um, to have a therapy that would uh, save people from sepsis, sick people. And so we were talking to the, the, the head of the Ministry of Health there in Mexico City, big building, Mexico City, big, beautiful place, Mexico City. Anyway, big place. And, and I, I remember um, I was, was sitting there at the, at the table, and we said, you know, we got this thing. We want to go to La Raza. We want to go to the military hospital and find these people dying of sepsis, inject them. So and the guy said to me, he says, he said, no, where he says, you're in Tecate? And I said, yeah, Tecate. He said, Is that, isn't that part of Baja, California? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, it's part of Baja, California. Why aren't you an important place? Why aren't you in Mexico City or Monterey or Guadalajara? What, what is this Tecate? I mean, Baja, California. <laughs> what is this Galilee stuff, you know? Is, you know, John 7, 25, John 7, 20, 7, 52, 7, 52. They answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And Nazareth, which is part of Galilee, Nazareth, in John 1, 46, Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? See? So, well, Galilee was his home. Galilee was the center of his activities. Galilee was where he was welcomed, and his, 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 but, but he's saying here his greatest accomplishment is not going to be in Galilee. Going to be in Jerusalem, the capital city, the Mexico city of, of Israel, the center of Judaism, the headquarters of the religious rulers. This is going to be the place where he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to be resurrected. It was at Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Why was Jerusalem so important? It was the center of sacrifice. There were three times in the year when all the males had to come to Israel, I mean to Jerusalem. And they had to come not empty-handed, in other words, with sacrifices in their hands. In Deuteronomy 16, 16, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, and in the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Jerusalem was the place of the sacrifice. You didn't make sacrifices in any other place. You came to Jerusalem, and that was the place where the Passover lamb was killed. Therefore, the Passover lamb of God had to be killed in Jerusalem. That's Jesus. And so he's told them why. He's told them now he must go to Jerusalem. And then, he's going to tell, and then he told them what's going to happen in Jerusalem. In verse 21, he says, suffer many things, be killed, be raised again. Now, he's told them the where. It has to be in Jerusalem. He's told them the, the, uh, the, the, the who is going to do these things, suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes because they made up the religious court. They made up the Sanhedrin. And, they and, and, and this told the disciples that he's going to be tried. He's going to be found guilty. He's going to be executed, uh, punished, uh, executed of a crime. And this group of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes were the people who should have been the first to worship and follow Christ. They should have been those who led and brought the people of Israel to worship and obey Christ. That's what they should have, that was their role. But this was the group who hated him the most. This was the group who led the people of Israel to call for his, crucify him, crucify him. 
and, and then he, he describes how he's going to suffer many things, he says, and then be killed. So when he says this, he's going to suffer many things, he's got the full view in his sight of the many things. He can see already that, 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 that what's going to happen to him. He has not turned his back on his sufferings. His sufferings are very much before his eyes, and the closer that he gets to it, the more and more vivid or in focus that all of this is going to happen. He, see, he sees himself standing right on the brink of it all, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and it says, for example, in Matthew 26, 37, Matthew 26, 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Jerry here, watch with me. And he went a little while further. He fell on his face. He prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then it says further in Luke uh, 22, 44, Luke 22, 44, being in an agony, he, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. So he, he's coming, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's coming, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in full view of everything he's going to suffer, and, and, and the many things are that he's going to suffer are pressing on him with such a heaviness that he feels like he's suffocating. He can't breathe. He's panting for air. He's struggling. He's looking for support. Anybody, support him. So he turns to his friends. He turns to James and John, and he turns to Peter, and he asks them, just be with me. And what do they do? They fall asleep. They're not supporting him at all. And then he turns to the Father, and he pleads for the cup. The cup of all these many things he's going to suffer. Take it away. Take it away. And he prays harder and harder, so much so that the blood vessels in his forehead, they burst under the blood pressure. His blood pressure has risen so high, it breaks the blood vessels. This is what happens when you have high blood pressure. That's why high blood pressure is so dangerous. You blow out your kidneys. You blow out the vessels in your brain. His blood pressure had risen so high, it blew out the blood vessels in his forehead, and his sweat now becomes large drops of blood that fall from his ground into the brown dirt, but now the dirt has become red with his blood. And all this is then ha happening as he's anticipating the sufferings he's going to go through. He's full of sorrows. Sorrows nearly cause him to die. And, he has be he, and, and, this is, and now he has gained this title of Isaiah 53.3, Isaiah 53.3, a man of sorrows. That's a, a man of sorrows. Like the hymn says, a man of sorrows. What a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. His sor sorrows are so heavy, they brought him to the edge of death. He's like ready to die from sorrow. If he had died from his sorrows, his death certificate would have stated, cause of death, sorrows. And he, and he, and he, and he, 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 and he doesn't die. Actually, God the Father sends him an angel to strengthen him so he doesn't die of sorrows it, but he doesn't because the sins of the world have not yet been put on him he's just dying from the anticipation of it all and, and but but because his purpose for his death must be to receive the sins of the world they will be placed on him he will die with those sins of the world on him but not yet so he so at this point he in in Matthew's 16, where we are now, he sees his eventual death I, I, for those sins, and, and he just says the words, he will be killed. Now, when you read this, and when I read this, given the way we, it, it just sounds so bleak. It sounds so sad. It sounds so hopeless. Suffering in, in, in what sounds like a public humiliation. He will be stripped naked, being tortured to death, and, 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 he, 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 and, and he's not crushed under this horrible anticipation where he is right now. He doesn't die under the weight of sorrows. Why? Why doesn't he die from the, the horrible anticipation? Why doesn't he die under the weight of the sorrows? Because the reason he doesn't die is because his eye has now changed 
from, 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 from his sufferings to a wonderful sight. He sees something wonderful, like a joy, and he plugs it right in at the in, 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 in verse 21, verse 21, when he says, and be raised again the third day. And he's quick to put that in there. And be raised again the third day. So it goes like this, verse 21, and be killed and be raised again the third day. It's a huge transition for him. In verse 21 where it says he must go to Jerusalem, that's downer, that's depressing. Suffer many things, that's a downer, that's depressing. By the elders and the priests and the chief, the chief priest and the, and the scribes, that's a downer, that's depressing. And be killed, that's a downer, that's depressing. And be raised again the third day, that's an upper, that's joyful. And you can be sure that when the Lord said, verse 21, that his voice changed, and he was quick to finish up that dismal description with that final statement, and be raised again the third day. And that was, that was, that was, that part was, just not spoken with the sorrowful, dismal tone. From that time forth, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem. He begins to show to his disciples how. In this one side, he begins to show, that's an important word, how. He begins to show unto his disciples how, <coughs> grab a hold of that word, how, he must go on to Jerusalem. Because when he describes how, there's two sides of that how. One side of that how is he's showing them how of what will happen to him. How he's going to be suffer many things, how he's going to be killed. But the way he so quickly added in that last statement, and be raised again the third day, he's showing them another side of the how. Another how, how he will be able to endure it. How is he going to do that? And when the Lord said how, it was going to be in verse 21, he's going to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of his enemies, and then be killed, he, he, his sorrow is set before him. But when the Lord said that how, in verse 21, he'd be raised again the third day, the Lord has set joy in front of him. He sees his own resurrection from the dead, and he sees joy. It's the joy of himself being raised from the dead. Never experienced that before. Himself being raised the dead on the third day. And this has enabled him to endure the sufferings that, and, and looking down on the shame that he's going to endure in verse 21 and just say, shame, I despise you. And this is his secret. This is his secret for enduring the suffering of many things. It's the joy of the resurrection that is set before him. And this is, when we look at Jesus, this is what we see in Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he has brought that joy of resurrection into his sight, and it's the same joy of resurrection he's already brought to others. He brought it to Jairus' daughter. He brought it to that boy, that young boy in the coffin. He brought it to Lazarus, and he was so happy to raise them from dead, from death. And he's going to, and he'll bring that joy of the resurrection to all of his followers, and he'll be so happy to raise them out of death. And now it's his turn. It's his turn to experience the greatest, what did I say about Disneyland, the happiest place on earth? This is the greatest ride in the universe, the resurrection. It's going to be a, it's a joy that's set before him. He can hardly wait. He can't wait. It's the joy of experiencing the resurrection that is set before him that's enabling him to endure the sufferings that he's talked about in verse 21. You know, we, we can endure a lot if we have something wonderful to look forward to afterwards. He endured the cross because he had something to look forward to afterwards, the joy of the resurrection. And that's why he so quickly added in verse 21, be killed and be raised again the third day. His own resurrection was only part of the joy. His own resurrection was only part of the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure the sufferings. There were many other things. Another joy was Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. 
we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So there's two joys in these verses of Hebrews 2, 9, and 10. First, there is the joy of being crowned with glory and honor. Forever he will, after this, be seen and known in heaven as Revelation 5, 6. Revelation 5, 6. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. God has never, ever, ever been known as a lamb that was slain for the sins of man. This is the first, first time. And this is a joy for him to be crowned with the glory and honor of becoming God the lamb that was slain. And forever he's going to be seen in heaven as God the lamb that was slain. Forever, he, forever he's going to be glorified and honored in heaven by all the saved as they point to him and say, he's the lamb of God. He's God the lamb who took away my sins. That's going to be a joy for him for eternity. Forever, the saved in heaven will see him and say, he's the reason I'm here. He's the reason I'm in heaven because he is my lamb, died for my sins. That's going to be a joy for him for eternity to have that, to be crowned with that glory and honor of God, the lamb of God, who took away the sin of, took away the, sin of the world, took away sins. So that's the first joy that's before him in the, the Hebrews 9, 2, Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. To be crowned with the glory and the honor of being the Lamb of God who took sin away. And that joy of being crowned with the honor and glory of God the Lamb slain enabled him to endure the cross of verse 21. And so there's a second joy in Hebrews 2, 9 through 10. Hebrews 2, 9 through 10. The second joy is bringing many sons unto glory. That's a particular joy for him. You imagine if they just imagine that there a, a, a cave, a, a mine, a, a shaft collapses, and there's trapped miners down there, and 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 the rescuers work diligently, and they 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 free up the escape route, and that first rescuer who goes down there, you imagine how joyful that is for that first rescuer. Yeah, that's who he is. He's bringing many sons uh, to glory. His followers have already seen him in, 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 um, <clears throat> in, in, in humiliation. They're going to see him in a suffering. And when that happens, when that happens, he's going to be the first one to go down to the mine shaft and bring out those miners. And in John 17, 24, he said, John 17, 24, he prayed to the Father, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the, of the world. He wants so much to bring him out of the mine shaft into glory, so they can see his glory. He wants to show them his glory. He's excited to show them heaven. It reminds me of my wife, Cheryl, just before she died, when it was obvious she was going to die, she knew she was going to die. And she said to me these words. She said, you know, all my life, uh, I, I've, I've lived a sheltered life. Yeah, she did, you know, in Ohio there. And sheltered life. And she said to me, but you, you went over to Europe and Switzerland and all these places, and you knew so much more about the world than I did, she said. And you were always showing me things that I didn't know. And she said, and that frustrated me. She didn't like that. And so she said, now I'm going to heaven before you. So that when you come to heaven, I can show you things you didn't know. <laughs> and that's a joy that's set before the Lord in bringing many sons to glory so that he can show them things in heaven. And that joy of being able to show his disciples his glory was a joy that has set before him that enabled him to endure the cross. Verse 21. And, and, and when the Lord talked about going to heaven before them, he he positioned himself as, a, as an architect, as in a construction 
an architect and builder, and you know, um, if you build a, not a track house, if you build a custom house, the architect will sit, sit down with, well, the White House in Loretto. It was Donna's house, we call it Donna's house. Because Donna sat down with Evo, the architect, and, and Evo explains that it was very painful because she was very particular. But anyway, they sat down and said, well, what do you like? And we'll do this, and what do you like? We'll do that, and do you like this? No, okay, we'll change that. And so the good architect that Evo is, um, gets to understand who the person is, what they like and don't like, and then the house gets made just the way it. she had to have a gray water system for the casita and the other one, and so there's a gray water system, and it's not built right. But anyway, it's just there. Anyway, and everything was just, the, he said that there was a time when he sat with her for three hours deciding the position of one window, he said. It was very, but it was just perfect the way she wanted it. Then her husband got a transfer of a job. She never lived in it and sold it to us. But anyway, um, the point is the house was made just the way she wanted it. This is Christ. He knows each one of our personalities. And with the knowledge of our personalities, he is going to make for each one of us a custom-made mansion. He said in John 14, 3, John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. There's so much you to the personality of the people, the individual personalities, that he's going to make a place custom made perfect. And what do you think is going to happen in heaven when we get to heaven? You think he's going to say, oh, John, oh, yeah, okay. Got you on the list here, 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 I got you. You, your house is at 238 Hallelujah Street. So you just go down two blocks down Redemption Boulevard and you'll find it and make that turn and here's your keys and you'll find your house there. You think he's going to do that? Are you kidding? He, 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 no way. He's taking a lot of time to think about what John would want. And it's going to be the perfect mansion for John. And so He's, gonna, he's taking the time to design that perfect house for John. He's not just going to tell him, go find your house. Here's your keys. He's going to take John to that house he's designed, built for him, gets the front door. He's going to tell John, cover your eyes. <laughs> you know, like they do on television. You know. Cover your eyes, lead him in there, and a big surprise. And that's the joy that he's going to have to show that the mansion he's prepared for each one. To show the mansion that he's prepared for each one is a joy that he set before him and it's enabled him to endure the cross. So what it says in Hebrews 10, 10, uh, 2, 10, 10, 2, 10, Hebrews 2, 10, that he became, it goes on in that verse to say that it's gonna bring many sons to glory and it says he's gonna, that he could be the captain of their salvation, the captain of their salvation. A captain is a person who goes before who leads. This was how David was known as. He was the one who went in the battle first. As a matter of fact, it got so dangerous for him. His, 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 uh, his, his, his uh, commander said, don't go out anymore with us. It's too dangerous. You're going out in front. But good captains go first. They don't sit in the back there like happened so often in World War II. You guys go there. No, but they were right out there in front. And that means, when it says that he was the captain of his salvation, it means that by his death and resurrection, he went first. He went first. That's what's meant in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, the, he was the first. We're the harvest. We're the ones who follow. But he was the first. See, because in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a trail was blazed that had never gone on before. You know, President Thomas Jefferson wanted so much for there to be a trail blazed to the Pacific Ocean that he searched out and found the perfect persons named Lewis and Clark. And he, and he, and he, he commissioned them to go from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean and they should blaze a trail, and, 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 and they did it. And they reached the Pacific or Oregon, Washington area. Very tough 
for Lewis and Clark. You read their, their, their diaries, it's just like, oh, wow, they almost lost their lives so many times from Indians that wanted to kill them, wanted to take things from them, wild animals, starvation, sickness, they lost people. But they continued on, and as they pressed on, they made very detailed maps, very detailed maps. You, know, you can see them. Very detailed maps because they knew they were blazing a trail for the first time that others were going to follow. They knew that they were not the last ones to go on this trail. They knew they were blazing the trail. And it was the joy of Lewis and Clark, it was the joy that Lewis and Clark had set before them that they were the pioneers blazing a trail that others would follow that caused them to endure. Well, when Christ spoke in verse 21 of himself being raised again the third day, he was like Lewis and Clark blazing a trail from, from death to life, not that St. Louis is death, but anyways, from death to life, that others would follow. And, and not only would others follow the Christ, uh, follow Christ in the trail that he was blazing, but he would do something that Lewis and Clark didn't do. He would be the guide. He would be the guide that would take everybody across that trail. And, and that's why it, it's meant, that's what it meant when it says in Hebrews 2.10, bringing many sons to glory, not sending many sons to glory, not pushing many sons to glory, but bringing them himself, bringing many sons to glory. And that was a joy, the joy that he set before him, the joy of blazing a trail from death to life that others were going to follow, and he would be the, the guide, and he's going to bring many sons to glory. That was a joy that enabled him to endure, um, verse 21, to endure the many things. And then, and then of course, there would be uh, uh, questions in heaven. Of course, there's going to be questions in heaven. You imagine somebody comes into this beautiful house, and, they, and this has been made for them, and they say, oh, this is so wonderful. This is so wonderful. How long do I get to live in this mansion? <laughs> you know? I mean, how long do I get to live in heaven? And it will be his joy to use a word, a word, and the word is author. Author in Hebrews 5.8. Hebrews 5.8. Though he were a son, 5.8.9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. It will be his joy to say, to, to, to take the question, how, how, how long? He said, forever, because I am the author of something new. I'm the author of eternal salvation, eternal <laughs> salvation. So he's gonna, he'll say, he'll say, you can stay here forever because I'm the author of eternal salvation. For him to be able to answer that question because he suffered, that's a joy that's set before him that, 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 that enables him to suffer many things at the hands of all of his enemies. And then there's going to be the joy that he will have accomplished the impossible. The impossible, which means he'll be able to answer the question, how can I be justified from all my sins? I mean, the enlightened soul knows how deep the stain is of his sins. <clears throat> and how impossible it is to wash it out with some good works, a whole bunch of good works. The enlightened soul knows, that, knows what the answer to the question that was asked Jesus is. In Matthew 19, 16, Matthew 19, 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The answer to that question is nothing. You cannot. The stain runs too deep. There's nothing. Now, we all know that when it comes to our sins, God says in, in Isaiah 118, Isaiah 118, your sins be as scarlet. It, it, we all know that Isaiah 118, Isaiah 118 says, they be red like crimson. When crimson stains a garment, you are never going to get that out. And those stains on the soul go so way down too deep to be able to be washed away with any good works. But he endures the many things that he's suffering in verse 21. And he set those things before him. The joy that he set before him is that his blood 
will we'll, we'll, we'll wash those stains out. Revelation 1.5, Revelation 1.5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So he endures these things because he knows his blood is going to be able to wash the sins away, and that is a joy for him, and that's what he puts in front of him. And then he also knows about his blood. 1 Peter 1.18, 1 Peter 1.18, you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without without blemish, without spot. So it's Christ's joy that he set before him to have the payment. A ransom has been found, it's his blood. And that's joyful. And then it's joyful for him, for him joyful for him to step in as, with a new role, a role that he has, which is a Hebrews 3.26 role, Hebrews 3.26. The, the role and the title that will be so joyful for him that he sees himself getting is he Romans 3.26, the justifier. He's going to become the justifier. The devil is the terminator. Right? But, but Christ is the justifier. Hebrews 4.5, Hebrews 4.5, him that justifieth. For Christ to become the justifier is a joy that's set before him and and, and, and there's only one way he could become the justifier, and the only way that he could be the justifier is Isaiah 53, 11, Isaiah 53, 11. With the travail of his soul that God will be satisfied with, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus will become the justifier, and that's joyful for him, when he suffers the load of our iniquities. And he sets this joy of becoming the justifier before him and enables him to endure all these things in verse 21. But the greatest joy, these are not the greatest joy, the greatest joy that he has set before him is this. He had a charge from God the Father. And that charge was that he should become the son. Psalm 2, thou art my son. This day have I begotten there, there, begotten me. There was a day when he, the second person in the Godhead, became the Son. And the Son, and the charge that God the Father gave him as the Son is that he would be sent. That's a very important word to get a hold of. Sent into the world to save the world from their sins. S sent is the essence of the word Messiah. John 3.16 is a Messiah verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he gave him, sent him, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The whole concept of Messiah is built around this word sent. He was always conscious that he was sent into the world. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. I am the Messiah sent. I want you to be little messiahs. As followers of Christ, we are little messiahs sent into the world to do the will of God. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. He accepted to do the will of God, the will of the Father, go into the world, and his response was to the charge from God the Father. Will you be my son? Will you be sent into the world? And his response is Psalm 40, verse 7. Psalm 40, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it's written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And as followers of Christ, our greatest victory over ourselves, over ourselves, is when we accept to do the will of God over and against our will. And he obeyed the Father's will. John 4, 34, John 4, 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And our greatest moment is when we obey God. That's our finest moment. And the greatest joy he has, therefore, in life, the greatest joy, is to receive the reward of pleasing God the Father. Now, there's a verse that he spoke that we always think, oh, that applies to us. No, it applies to him also in Matthew 25, 21. Matthew 25, 21. His Lord, and think of this as God the Father, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good 
and faithful servant. I have, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We always think that verse is applying to us in our lives, but it applies to Christ. He's talking about himself when he says this. Because he was the good and faithful servant that obeyed the Father. And the joy of thy Lord is the joy of hearing the Lord be so happy that he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That was the greatest joy that the Lord Jesus set before him to be able to hear the Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, that caused him to endure all these many things. It's all these joys are set before him. The joy of personally experiencing the resurrection from the dead. The joy of bringing many sons to glory. The joy of blazing the trail from death to life. The joy of being the guide to bring those many sons to glory. The joy of being the author of eternal salvation and rejoicing with the angels who he talked about in Luke 15, 7. Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. The joy of showing the custom-made mansion to each one of his sons that he's brought to glory. The joy of showing those many sons his glory that he spoke about. The joy of being the justifier of the ungodly. The joy of washing their sins away with his blood. The joy of redeeming lost souls with his blood. And finally, the joy of hearing the Father say to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All that was part of what made up the joy that he set before him to endure, verse 21, suffering many things. And the more we see the joy that Jesus set before him, the more we'll understand how he held up under all that burden in verse 21. The, that's the Hebrews 12 to Hebrews 12 to who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The more we set the joy in front of us, the more we'll be able to endure our hardships like Becky Mader wrote to me this last week. She wrote, hi, Tom. It hardly seems possible that our time with my mom in San Diego is over. I wanted every moment to stretch out, and it was so hard to say goodbye the night before we left. My great consolation was the thought of heaven. No more goodbyes and to be with Jesus. See, the joy that Becky set in front of her was the thought of heaven. No more goodbyes and to be with Jesus. We endure as Jesus did when we set joy before us. And one of the reasons that the Lord told his disciples in verse 21 that he's going to suffer all these many things and so forth was that he didn't want them to be surprised about what's going to happen. So that they would understand that what was going to happen to him was, the reason it was all going to happen to him was because of Acts 2.23. Acts 2.23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you've taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. When it says that in Acts 2.23, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, that means the sufferings of Christ and the death of Christ was not a surprise to heaven. As a matter of fact, the words determinate counsel, counsel means there's more than one person involved in this discussion. Determinate means there was a decision, a conclusion. So the sufferings of Christ, the death of Christ, were discussed in advance. And they were agreed upon by Christ as God the Son and by God the Father. That's the reason Christ walked right into the hands of his captors. He walked right into the hands for the suffering. And that's described in John 18.3. John 18.3. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? So he's not trapped by his captors. He could have escaped at any moment. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him, and that's what he was describing in verse 21. And he voluntarily walked right into their hands. John 18, 4. John 18, 4. Jesus knowing, therefore, all things that should come upon him went forth. And that's the reason why verse 21 showed his disciples what he was going to suffer, how he was going to be killed, because he wanted them to know that he knew what was going to uh, take place, how he was going to be tortured to death. And he wanted them to know he had agreed to be taken and tortured to death. That was a determinate counsel. Okay. But this message 
that Christ agreed with. That he's going to be taken, tortured to death. It didn't set well with Peter. And Peter immediately tried to stop that kind of talk about sufferings and being killed in verse 22. Verse 22. Then Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. For Peter, it didn't matter if Christ agreed or not. For Christ, as his leader, to be publicly humiliated, stripped naked, have his skin ripped off of his back, have the hairs of his beard pulled out, be beaten to a pulp, publicly tortured to death on a cross. No, 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 no. That's over the top for Peter. Absolutely not. Not for Peter. So Peter got pretty bold in verse 22 when it says, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. I don't really know what he did when it says Peter took him. Maybe Peter grabbed a hold of Christ and shook him and said, shake that idea of suffering and being killed right out of you. And for that matter, Peter was always the chief speaker. So for the, the, the disciples, he always said what nobody else wanted to say. And so he, 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 he evidently we conclude that all the rest of them agreed that was a terrible idea for Christ to be suffering and be killed like that. Now the Lord has just said in verse 21, he must go unto Jerusalem. He uses the word must, must. And, and Peter has just said, this shall not be, in verse 22, verse 22, this shall not be. So Christ said in verse 21, Christ said in verse 21, this shall be. And, and Peter says in the next verse, it shall not be. As, as a matter of fact, Peter, when he does this, he uses a word that he should not have used. It doesn't match what he said at all. And that word is Lord in verse 22. Verse 22, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You can't say that. You cannot say no and Lord together. It's either yes, Lord, or it's just no without saying Lord. Because to call him Lord means you accept his will, which is why Christ said and asked the disciples, in, in, in Luke 6.46, Luke 6.46, he says, why do you do that? He says, Luke 6.46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He's saying, you can't do that. You can't call me Lord and then say no. You can't call Christ Lord and not, and not do what he says to do. And there's only two responses. It's either yes, Lord, or simply no, but not no, Lord. And that's what Peter said in verse 22. In verse 22, he said, no, Lord, this shall not be to you. And that's, that's the way it is in our lives. We cannot say, we cannot call Jesus Lord and say no. Because if we say no, he cannot be our, called our Lord. He can only be our Lord if we say yes. So Peter's protest here brings a pretty quick and strong response back to Peter in verse 23. Verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So when it says he turned, I don't know what Peter did. Peter put his hand on his shoulder, and, but whatever he did, when it says he turned, you can just picture the scene of how serious this was for the Lord Jesus, as if the Lord spun on his heels to confront Peter. I mean, this was his friend. This is his dear friend, Peter. Who had, and, and Peter was standing in the way of Christ right now. Christ is on his way down that road of suffering, down that road of death, down that road to the cross and the resurrection. And so we can just, we can just picture that in verse 21. He's going down the road. We can picture Christ with his words pointing himself down the road of sacrifice in order to accomplish all those joys that set before him. And now Peter stands in the way of his road. He's blocking the way. He's blocking the way of Christ going down that road, doing the Father's will to bring many sons to glory. And the Lord is not going to let Peter block his way. He's not going to let him stand in his road. A actually, there were many obstacles that stood in, 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 in the road that Christ was on in the way of the Lord going down the road to the cross. This was just one roadblock he had to move out of the way. This was a roadblock of his dearest friends trying to stop him from going to the cross. And here he pushes that roadblock of his friends out of his way. There was a roadblock of his own personal will, his, how he felt about it that tried to stop him from going to the cross, which we already quoted. 
Matthew 26, 39, Matthew 26, 29, when he fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as, my, as I will, but as thou wilt. I will was a roadblock for him. That was a roadblock for him trying to stop him in the Garden of Gethsemane from going to the cross, and he had to push that out of the way. And as with Peter, as with his own will, there were other roadblocks that stood in the way of him going to the cross. And the Lord pushed all those roadblocks out of the way as he moved down the road to the cross. And he says in, in verse 23, Get thee behind me. Now he says, Get thee behind me, because he was moving down the road to the cross, and anything that was, in, that was blocking him was in front of him. And so he's going to push it out of his way so that roadblock would become behind him, no longer block his way. Whatever roadblock he saw in, the, in, the wind, in his windshield was in front of him, and he was determined to see that roadblock in his rearview mirror behind him. So when the Lord said to Peter in verse 23, get thee behind me, that's the same as the Lord saying to Peter, get in my rearview mirror as I watch your opposition to me going to the cross get smaller and smaller because I'm moving. I'm moving toward the cross. And this is what the Lord meant when he said to Peter with his opposition, get thee behind me. Get thee behind me. Now the Lord says something very shocking when he says in verse 23, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You imagine his disciples looking at each other and saying, Satan? He's talking to Peter. Has anyone seen Satan here? He must be confused. He's talking to Peter. He's not talking to Satan. One of his disciples might have come to him and said, Lord, you made a mistake. That's Peter you're talking to, not Satan. But the Lord didn't make a mistake. And that was Satan he was speaking to. Because, it, it, because Peter was speaking for Satan. And that brings out a question. How could, at one moment, Peter speak the words that have been revealed to him by God the Father in verse 16 and say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the next moment, he, 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 from then, very next moment, he's speaking the words of Satan in, in, in verse 22. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. How could the same person in one moment be controlled by God the Father and in the next moment be controlled by Satan? It happened. It happened. And what that means for us is the words of the hymn, My soul, be on thy guard. Ten thousand foes arise. The hosts of sin are pressing hard to draw thee from the skies. Peter has just been drawn from the skies by the host of, of sin. And just like Peter, one minute we can be listening to God, speaking for God, acting for God. The next moment we can be listening to Satan, speaking for Satan, and acting for Satan. And so it's a call for us to, my soul be on thy guard. And then the Lord addresses Satan, who's taken control of Peter. And the Lord says to Satan, thou art an offense unto me. Now, he didn't tell Satan that, that, that uh, he didn't tell Satan, what he, what he said to Satan, he didn't tell Satan that, that what he said, you know, get behind me, was an offense to him. He told Satan you yourself are an offense to me. An offense is something that stands in your way. It just, that, that's the equivalent of the Lord saying, Satan, you are in front of me, opposing me. I see you in my front windshield, and, and, and you blocked my way from going forward. You're in my way. You're an offense to me. I'm going to remove you out of my way, and I'm going to put you behind me so that I see you in my rearview mirror. And we see how standing in the way of Christ going to the cross has been his dear friends. It's been Christ's own will. Well, here's the ultimate roadblock, which is Satan himself. And this is the mission of Satan. The word Satan means adversary, like an opponent. And it means that he opposes God, especially when it comes to Christ going to the cross. And Satan threw anything and everything in Christ's way on the road for him to go to the cross. Because every one of those, Hebrews 2.10, many sons being brought to God's glory. Every one of those sons is a person who is extracted out of the many being brought into Satan's hell. And Satan doesn't cotton well to, to, to losing souls from going to hell. His hell. It's his hell. And then the Lord said to Satan in, in verse 23, 
thou savorest not the things that be of God, but things that be of men. If you look at any other Bible translation, they've replaced that word, savorest. No, no, savorest. You don't have an interest. They say things like that, you know. I like the word savor. It's an interesting word. So, it, 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 you know, it, you picture a person savoring food, you know, like a nice New York steak. <laughs> Looks so good. You look at it, you savor it. You smell it before you take a bite out of it, you savor it. You take a bite, you chew it softly, you taste it, that's savoring. You know, there's a great fish taco place in Loretto called El Rey Fish Tacos. And my friend um, Eric made a great video, it's, 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 it's fantastic, of the El Rey Fish Taco place with this Baroque music, it's really something. Anyway, at the, at the last there, he's got this kid that, that's come in there. Oh, yeah, it's so good. You know, he, the little kid comes in and she, there's no, you don't hear the kid, but she says, and he goes, two, and then she says, and then the kid mouths out, tacos pescado, and he says, fish tacos. <laughs> it was really good. Anyway, the kid, the kid gets these, this fish taco, and he takes his first bite of the fish taco, and the kid, before he takes the bite, he shuts his eyes. He goes like that, you know. <laughs> So good. And he bites it so slowly into the taco, and he closes his eyes, and he chews it very so slowly. And then what Eric did is that he, he caught a, uh, a gecko, a little gecko, and he starved the gecko. To, and then he, he put it on a branch, and then he put a butterfly there, and he had a video, slow motion video, of the, of the, the gecko climbing up the branch, and he chomps into the Butterfly, but as he does, you see the gecko close his eyes. The same way like the kid did. It's masterful. <laughs> Puts those two together. Anyway, the gecko, the kid, they just, they, 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 they enjoying every part of it. Chew it very slowly. That's savoring. That's savoring. To enjoy it. And this is what the Lord is saying to Satan. Satan, you have no enjoyment. You have no savoring of the holy things of God. You have enjoyment and savoring the sinful things of man. And the Lord Jesus was all about enjoying and savoring the holy things of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our Lord Jesus and all the time that he took to explain all these things to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.